I've often thought that climate change scientists are really weird in terms of science. We're probably the only scientists in the world that wake up every day and hope that we're wrong. Ecologist Leslie Hughes is one of Australia's most recognisable and influential climate change scientists, and one of the first to warn how global heating could cause species extinctions around the world. I knew what my first question was going to be until I saw this incredible picture of you with Sir David Attenborough. Uh, his producer had contacted me about some research that I'd done that they wanted to film about. It was about ants and stick insects. So I spent a day out in the bush um, out of Sydney with Sir David and the crew, being the ant wrangler for that little segment. The ant so wrangler? I was the angle, ant wrangler. How did you go from ants to, to climate, climate change? change. I did my PhD on ants dispersing seeds around because it's quite an important part of Australian ecology. But after four years of following ants around the bush, and I still love ants, but I figured that I didn't want to spend the rest of my career doing that. And my then PhD supervisor said to me, well, you know, what about climate change? Maybe that's something you should look into. Uh, and this was in about 1989 to 1990. And I thought, oh, well, you know, if I do something that sounds a bit more applied and a bit more important, maybe I'll actually get a job. So I had quite a, a mercenary introduction to climate change. I can confess that now. Yeah. And around 1990, um, what's the world of climate change academia look like? I could at that time read all of the literature on climate change, all of it. It was really not a subject of political interest, social interest, economic interest. It was really more of an academic interest. I thought it would be big eventually, but I think it seemed a long way off in terms of being a real problem. I think in about 2000, you write a paper that is almost ringing the bell because you, you write that there was already evidence that climate change was affecting a lot of species. How did those numbers personally affect you and impact on how you saw climate change? I, I guess I was surprised at how many examples of things I was able to find even in what was still kind of early days in, in climate change biological research. The second paper that was published in Nature in 2004 was actually at the time extremely controversial. Awesome. I remember finding out that the editor of Nature had told the lead author, Chris Thomas, that they got more uh, letters protesting to Nature about that paper than they'd ever had for any other paper published in Nature to what, date. What were people worried about? The paper was the first one really that drew two phrases together, species extinctions and climate change. It was really the first paper to try and mathematically quantify how many species were going to be threatened with extinction because of climate change. And the numbers were big. One of the yeah. controversies was of course that as it was reported, especially in the media, committed to extinction and being extinct wasn't really distinguished. Right. Um, we weren't saying that all those things were going to be extinct by 2050, but rather they might be on a downward spiral towards extinction because the climate was changing so rapidly. The idea of hundreds of thousands of species being at, at risk from a changing climate and from disappearing, maybe before they've even been described in the, yep. in the literature. That's right. Um, how do you feel about that? How, does that weigh heavily on, on you? It weighs heavily, especially when I go snorkelling, for example. You know, if you go snorkelling on the Great Barrier Reef and the Great Barrier Reef suffered four massive bleaching events uh, within the space of seven years due to marine heat waves. And that's when it really comes home to me because you, you, you snorkel in these gorgeous places with this just incredible life and you think, 10, 20, 30 years time, will this all be gone? And that's when it makes me cry. Do you ever have those moments where you allow yourself to grieve a little bit, maybe, for what I, I, we might be about to lose? I, I don't, I've never done it on camera. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do grieve. Yes, I do. I, I try not to because there's a point at which if you keep focusing on the negative and the grief, you're not in a position to do positive things and move forward. I think 
for most climate change scientists, we, we become quite good at partitioning off bits of our brain. You know, you put all the negative stuff in a, in a little box and you put a wall around it and you try to keep going. It's a very, very grim picture going forward. But if you then also twin that with thinking about um, hope, optimism, motivation, ingenuity, innovation, motivation of, of people that care, that kind of leavens the, the catastrophizing. So, and I think most of us have all of that in our heads at the same time. At, at what point do you start to think, well, um, I'm doing my science, I'm telling people what might happen. Um, is there a point where you start to think, I need to also be an advocate or yep. for, for taking action? I didn't wake up one morning and thought, I need to be a science communicator. Over time, however, especially through the early 2000s, as climate change was starting to bite as, a, as an issue. Um, bite politically or bite, bite in the community? Bite politically, bite in terms of public consciousness, etc. I started getting asked to do things, you know, to go on committees. Over time, I think because I'd got into the climate change space early, before it was particularly controversial, and developed, you know, some what I hope was credibility as knowing something about it, that started to lead to opportunities, um, which eventually led to opportunities to actually really speak out. I want to ask you a bit about the Climate Commission. This was set up by the Gillard government in 2011. Why was that set up and how did you get involved? Involved, yeah. yeah. Thinking back to 2011, Julia Gillard had a hung parliament. So the independents and the Greens had quite a lot of power and so they pretty much pushed the government into putting a price on carbon. It probably sounded like a pretty radical policy at the time. They actually needed to explain the policy and its consequences to the Australian people. So they set up the, uh, the Climate Commission basically to do that. The Climate Commission's first report is called the Critical Decade. Why was it the Critical Decade as far as the Commission was concerned anyway? Well, it was pretty clear from the science at the time that the climate was actually changing and changing very rapidly. And we were already measuring impacts on the environment, on the severity and frequency of extreme events, on health, on, on the economy, on everything. So it was, it was pretty clear that we needed to wake people up to the immediacy and urgency of the problem. You know, I, I think that uh, the climate change science uh, is far from settled. Tony Abbott was known for his rejection of climate science. I think he described it as... Crap. Crap. He becomes Prime Minister and one of the first things he does, within a couple of days, I think, is to close the Climate Commission down. How does it feel to be closed down by a climate science denier? It was disappointing, but it wasn't a surprise. What that did allow us to do was to fund the Climate Council because there were so many Australians who were so pissed off that that had happened. I mean, a lot of them were pissed off about Abbott being the Prime Minister in the first place. The, the Climate Council came up with a report a few years ago that essentially said you can wave goodbye to 1.5 degrees. Was that a good move to encourage people and give people hope? One of the things we had to do as the Climate Council was talk to all the other climate advocacy groups to get them to understand, because a lot of the pushback we got was from those groups to say, no, we can't give up on 1.5. And we were saying, we're not giving up on 1.5. We still need to stay below 1.5. But the science tells us we will go over 1.5, at least temporarily. This year especially, there's been so many disasters, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, that are exactly what has been predicted, maybe even greater than predicted for now, that in a sense the climate is showing the way on its own without us actually having to talk about it. How do you keep people hopeful? What do you tell them? There's a saying in the climate movement that the antidote to despair is action. It's a slogan, but I think it's a really important slogan.
If you just sort of sit around wringing your hands and saying we are all doomed without actually getting off the couch to do something, we are indeed all doomed. You know, the atmosphere is not affected by what we think. It's only affected by what we do. So I guess my, the way I try to put it to people is, look, it's bad now. It is going to get even worse. We have to be prepared to cope and adapt but we should use this as another teaching moment to promote urgency. And the way, the best way I know not to feel despairing and helpless is to do something. And so I feel that my job now as a communicator is not even so much to explain the science anymore, though if people want me to do that, I can do that. Um, it's to actually motivate action. We often get this debate in Australia in, in, in politics when there is a disaster that's got a climate element to it. Don't talk, this is not a time to talk about climate change. How dare you talk about climate change? What do you think when you hear that? Don't no, the have, opposite. Right. Um, I think that's, those are teaching moments. You know, as a climate science communicator, those are the times when you actually have to uh, sensitively use catastrophes to make a point. And that sounds like a really hard-nosed mercenary thing, but given that that's what climate change means and it means it happening more and more frequently and worse and worse, we can't afford to let those teaching moments go past. If your PhD supervisor had not suggested have a look at climate change yeah. 30 years ago. What do you think you would have done? And do you think you probably would have found your way to the same spot anyway? I think it's a really good question. I think I would have come to climate change eventually. And in fact, sometimes, and it's probably an unfair thing to think, I, I look around at some of my colleagues that are working on other things, thinking, how can you do that? How can you work on something and spend time on something that is just not so important? And in some ways, and this is going to sound really strange, I feel privileged to have dedicated my a lot of my career to climate change. I think it's a privilege to work on something that's important. Um, and in some ways, that's an in, a much more, I feel I've had a much more interesting and enriched and exciting career because of the opportunities that's given me. Um, to hopefully make some sort of a difference than certainly I would have if I'd stuck to ants walking around the bush. <laughs>